Our second scripture today is from the Gospel of Mark. It continues from last week's section. It feels like it's just a catena of uh, teachings of Jesus that kind of got all put together because they didn't know where else to put them. Uh, this particular one, though, is important enough that it appears in all three of the Synoptic Gospels, almost exactly the same in all three of them. Mark 10, 17 to 31. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not defraud honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all of these since my youth. Jesus looked at him, loved him, and said, You lack one thing. Go sell what you own, give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then, then come follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words, but Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and fields with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. Every job has things that you have to do. In some circles, they're called the paying the rent tasks. Sometimes they're fun, sometimes they're inspiring, sometimes they're meaningful, sometimes they're just tedious, none of that matters. They are the paying the rent tasks, and you have to do them. One of the paying the rent tasks for a pastor is pretty obvious, isn't it? You write a sermon and you preach it on Sunday. And I have to say that I'm going to sort of sidestep this, which was why when I told you that the sermon wasn't going to be shorter, and I went, well, um, after Carolyn said, well, you were, maybe we weren't going to have a sermon. <laughs> and, and, and the reality is that we sort of aren't. Um, my sermons follow a very predictable pattern every week, and we've talked about that before. My preaching professor called it his dyadic model, and there were six little pieces that happened. First you began with, what's the human situation in the Bible, what's God's good news to that, and what is the people's response to it, and then what is our human situation that parallels that one, what is God's good news for us, and what is our response supposed to be. And my sermons all pretty much have those six pieces in them. And, and I, you know, I learned it from my preaching professor all those years ago, and I believed it then, and I still believe it now, that for it to be a biblical sermon, you really need to have all six of those things. Okay, you can argue or not, but that's where I come from every Sunday. Today, well, and, and, and in that model, the two probably most important pieces for us are what's God's good news for us, and what does God want us to do about that? And, and so that's 
you know, hopefully where sermons go. You can judge that. Go back and watch some of them on YouTube and decide whether I ever do those things. <laughs> but I'm sidestepping it today because when I read that passage, two pieces jump out at me. The first is that there's not a whole heck of a lot of good news in it. And the second is, I'm not sure what the human response is supposed to be. Then you add on top of that, the passage makes me feel really, really uncomfortable. Probably more than any other passage in the Bible. So, I'm going to kind of sidestep a little bit today, and, and I'm not sure that I would call what I'm going to do a sermon. Instead, I'm just going to wrestle a little bit with what this passage says and hopefully inspire all of us to do the same. I really don't know what to tell you you're supposed to do with it. And, and anything that I would put in there, I think, is either being unfaithful to the passage or being way, way preachier than I feel comfortable being. When I read this passage, the first thing that pops out is, I don't know whether we should read this as directions for all Christians. Is Jesus really telling us that all of us are supposed to sell everything we have, give it to the poor, and then go off and follow Jesus? Clearly, most of the Christians through history didn't think that was the case. His earliest disciples, on the other hand, did. They literally did just that. They left everything behind to follow Jesus. They left behind their families, they left behind their jobs, they left behind all of their stuff, and they walked off into the wilderness following Jesus. The earliest church in the book of Acts, the first gatherings that we hear of, took it literally. Because we, we hear that the first thing they did was they sold all of their possessions and pulled all of that money and the leaders of the church distributed it as it was needed. By the time we start to hear, read about Paul's churches, the ones that he had founded, it doesn't look like they're quite going that far anymore, but they still took that whole idea of generosity and support of others very seriously, because Paul talks about them sending money from one church to another, and, and indeed to him, to help support as needs were there. So, when I read it, I, I don't know what the expectation really is for us. But I do read that one warning very, very clearly. It's more difficult for a rich person to get into heaven than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Now, in some church circles, you may have heard a story that that really was referring to a gate in the city of Jerusalem that was a little bit small, so before the camel could get through, they had to unload it all, and the camel had to kind of crawl through, and then they put all the stuff back on it. It's not true. That was just a way of some folk trying to justify this passage and make sense of it. No, when Jesus was, was telling this story to him, it was clearly hyperbole, but he also meant them clearly to see a real camel and a real needle. It's as hard for a, harder for a rich person to get into heaven than a camel to get through the eye of a needle. And we know the disciples took it very seriously because they, these ones who had given up everything to follow Jesus, still say, how can anybody be saved? How can anyone, even us who've given up everything? And here's where the passage gets really hard for me. And I'm going to be completely and absolutely personal about this. I'm rich. I don't feel rich. I don't live extravagantly, I don't think. When we go shopping, we look at price tags. I don't remember the last piece of clothing I purchased that wasn't on sale. I, I don't. I literally, I don't. We seek out bargains. We go, when we go grocery shopping, we go to at least three stores. 
First we go to the large, inexpensive one in Lompoc, because everything's cheaper there. Then we go to the grocery outlet, because everything's really cheap there, but half the time you don't get what you really want. And then, finally, we go to Albertsons. And we never buy, well, not never, but we rarely buy things at Albertsons that aren't on sale. And then about once a month or so, we go to Costco and we buy the stuff that we get at Costco. And we're, we're extravagant enough that we have space that I can put 25 rolls of paper towels someplace. <laughs> but we take those things seriously. We, we look at prices. We look at prices. And when we're buying a can of black beans, if we can get this can for 69 cents and this can is 99 cents, we don't care what the label says on it. We get the 69 cent one. That's what we do. And he said all of that, I live very comfortably. I eat well, probably too well. <laughs> we have a nice condo that we live in for which we pay an exorbitant monthly payment. We drive one decent car and one clunker, but we have two cars in our house. I do have some expensive, expensive musical instruments, or at least some musical instruments that to non-musicians would look expensive. For musicians, Probably not so much. I remind people when they look at a price on a guitar, think if you played bassoon. A beginner's level bassoon costs more than my most expensive guitar. And an intermediate level bassoon costs more than all of my musical instruments together. you notice how I'm justifying. <laughs> I have a nice computer tablet. We heard Siri say hello to us a little earlier. But it's over a year old. My computer is over six years old. That is ancient in computer terms. More justification, right? <laughs> we try to make as minimal of impact on the environment as we can. We try to take seriously the, the issues that Carolyn raised about global warming. I have a plug-in car. Um, I, I, play this game with myself to see how high a mileage I can get coming to work and going home. Coming from Buellton to here, it's a lot of downhill, I can get as high as 103 miles to a gallon. Going home, it's more uphill. It's usually, if I do really well, it's about 73. Usually 65. But I play that game. I play that game. And, and, and I drive more slowly now, because I'm watching that thing on the little computer in my car. And I know there's a difference, and it's crazy. From 65 to 70, my mileage goes down. So I pay attention. But I know what rich looks like. I live in Santa Barbara County. And so I just don't feel like that, that term applies to me. But if I begin to look at some numbers, I start to feel like, well, maybe it does apply to me. And when I put it in the context, when I, when I get outside of Santa Barbara County and start to look at the United States as a whole, or the world as a whole, or even more so in history as a whole, I start to feel like rich is a pretty reasonable descriptor of me. Some numbers. The median household income in the United States, the median household income, that means half are above and half are below, in the United States right now is $59,039. For individual earners, the median income is $30,000 a year. The highest 20%, when you start to talk with people, when you talk about what's upper class, they usually talk the top quintile top 20%. The top 20% of income begins at $121,000. The top 1% of earners start at about $250,000. Now, 
Now, there are some crazy wealthy people. There were 143 households in the United States last year with wages, not income, just wages of over $50 million a year. That puts them in the top 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 9 percent. In 2015, there were 202 households that had over $50 million in income, period. There were 133,000 in households with wages over a million dollars. Now, if we take it to the world as a whole, I can start to feel I'm not rich because there are eight men in the world, and you'll notice they're all men, who have the amount of wealth that is the equivalent of the poorest 3.6 billion people. Eight, 3.6. But if you have an income of $32,000 a year in the world, that puts you in the top 1%. If you have $770,000 worth of net wealth, that puts you in the top 1%. And those of us who own houses here in greater Santa Barbara, well, you're in. The median net wealth in India, median again, half the people have more, half the people have less, is $68. That's $68 worth of property. In Africa, it's a little higher than that. It's $411. 10% of the world still lives on $2 a day or less. The per capita income in Burundi is the lowest in the world at $280 a year. The highest in the world is Norway, $82,000 a year. Worldwide, per capita is about $10,000, with Haiti being the lowest in North America at $780. The highest in Africa is $970 per capita. The U.S. per capita income is about $58,000. And when we look at all of those numbers, we have to realize they get skewed higher by those couple of people who make crazy amounts of money up at the top. If we took Jeff Bezos out of those numbers, that 58,000 per person would drop significantly. Two websites you can look at that will probably make you feel both really good and really bad about yourself. <laughs> First is givingwhatwecan.com, which you put in your, your income and it tells you where you fall in the world. And then in, in good Christian fashion it says, and if you give 10%, of your income, this is where that would put you, and this is what that 10% could do for someone else. And then the global rich list does a similar thing, where it shows you where your wealth, and you can also do both wealth and income, either one, it will show you where you fit in the whole world. Okay, all of that said, I'm rich. I'm rich. And I have no idea what to do with this passage. <laughs> I've preached on it before, and every time I've preached on it before, it's been one of two uh, uh, themes. It's either, don't be overly materialistic. It sounds like a reasonable way to go, doesn't it? Or, figure out what the first thing is and put the first thing first. Both sound like good sermons. Both sound like reasonable sermons for those of us who live in our society. And, and then I start to, to think about what that would mean. And we've got some really good examples of it. Char Charles Wesley was one example. It, at the height of his life, Charles Wesley was one of the most famous speakers in the world. And when he went to preach, thousands of people would come and they gave lots and lots of money. And he got lots and lots of money. He was rich, sort of. But as, as he was growing older, Wesley decided that the way he was going to deal with income was he was going to decide what was a reasonable income to have. And that would be his cap. And so, say his reasonable income in today's dollars was $30,000. I have no idea what it was. 
or what it would be. But just for example's sake, say $30,000, he was going to live on $30,000 a year regardless of how much money came in. And the rest he was going to give away. So if next year he got $32,000, he gave $2,000 away. If five years after that he got $150,000, he gave $120,000 away. He stayed at that level. Sounds like a good plan. Then another example, you may have seen some of the memes that have been going around with a picture of J.K. Rowling, that she was booted off the Forbes list of billionaires because she gave over $160 million to charities last year. And good for her. Good for her. And, and you know, say as Christians, it's good to take that, that kind of, those examples as, as, as positive examples and to try to be generous, to try to share the blessings that we have. And, and it sounds like a reasonable read of this passage to think about that in terms of, yes, we need to be generous, we need to be giving, but the passage is stronger than that. That's not what it says. The rich man isn't told, divest of your goods until you get just comfortable. It isn't, he isn't even told, divest of your goods until you feel a little bit uncomfortable. He's told, divest of all of it. All of it. I found an article by a, a preaching professor at Lexington Seminary this week. Leah Shade is her name. And, and in her article, she was struggling with this passage. She didn't help. She had a, an extended quote in her article from another seminary professor, one of my, my favorite uh, scholars, an Old Testament scholar named Walter Brueggemann. And, and in her article she says, Walter Brueggemann is no help. He says that we want to tone down the radical material specificity of Jesus, seminary professor talk. No kidding, she says. In his book, Money and Possessions, he writes, it's clear that Jesus was preoccupied with this worldly material reality and the ways in which money and possessions define and skew our social relationships. She says, okay, I'm with him so far. He continues, Jesus, this gets real seminary talk, Jesus' ministry conducted in subversive act and in disruptive word concerned the performance of an alternative economy willed by God in defiance of the dominant economy that was legitimized by Rome and practiced by those who accepted imperial hegemony with its exploitative protocols. Jesus', Jesus term for this alternative economy was the kingdom of God, that is, a social practice and set of social relationships that are congruent with the God of the covenantal Torah, of ancient Israel. <laughs> and she translates that as, my God, and I mean that for real, he's talking about a redistribution of wealth. My wealth? You've got to be kidding me. Nope, says Brueggemann. Life with Jesus isn't about redistributing wealth, it's about abandoning. This passage sure makes it feel like Brueggemann is correct. And for the life of me, I don't know what to do with that, and I feel awfully uncomfortable about it. Because frankly, I'm not ready to abandon all wealth. He says, Jesus is not calling us to live like Charles Wesley, he's calling us to live like St. Francis. And that doesn't make any sense. I mean, think of it for a second. If all of us sold everything and gave it all away tomorrow, who would give it away in the day after that? Who would take care of us? Who would be there to give the alms to St. Francis if all Christians had given away everything already? It feels like there is no good or even reasonable answer to this call. It feels like the response of the disciples is the only one you can make. Who then can be saved? What do you do with this? It's crazy. Pretty literally. And I feel really uncomfortable with that. And Jesus responds. Yep. Yeah. 
It's impossible. Camels don't go through eyes of needles. Rich people don't go to heaven. That's how it is. It's not possible. Oh, 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 wait a second. But for God, even the impossible is possible. So, where do I come out of all of that? I feel like I have to wrestle with this passage. I feel like I have to read it and I have to realize that God is not calling me to be generous. God is calling me to give everything away. And that my response is not unexpected or unreasonable or maybe not even unfaithful when I say, nah, ain't gonna happen. But the question still is there and I still have to wrestle with it. And I still have to wrestle with what in the world does it mean when God's call to me is to abandon wealth when I really don't want to do that. Indeed, I spend all of my life planning and working to make sure that that's not an issue for me. When my ministers and missionaries benefit board representative came to our house to talk to me about retirement a couple of years ago and said, yeah, if you keep going the way you're going, you'll have enough in your retirement account that you can stay where you are right now. I said, thank you, Jesus. I didn't say, oh, I'm going to give it all away. <laughs> and I don't have an answer. That's the paying the rent part. I'm supposed to have answers, right? I'm supposed to be able to come up here and preach a sermon and tell you something and you'll go home and say, well, this is what Roy said I was supposed to do after this passage. Even if you go home and say, Roy was crazy. That, I don't believe a word of that. At least I've done my job and I've paid the rent today. And frankly, there is some good news in it because in spite of the fact that it feels like there is no answer to the question and that it feels both impossible and unreasonable to take this passage seriously, but yet we have to take it seriously. We do have that good news that even when it is impossible and unreasonable and it doesn't make any sense, and the pastor who spent all of these years struggling with scripture passages and has no idea what to do with this, God says, it's okay. I'm here. And even the impossible, well, with me it's possible. So wrestle with it. Take it seriously. Struggle with it. But don't let it make you crazy. Because I'm here. 